Hello, everyone. This is the 99th episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles and the Soccer Nostalgia blog, and I am joined by Paul from Shipley in England and the 1888 Letter blog. We are pleased to have Irish freelance writer, historian, and broadcaster, Mr. John O'Carroll, once again on our podcast. For this episode, we continue our interview series with Mr. O'Carroll as we discuss the matches of the Republic of Ireland national team during the 1988-89 season. Welcome back, John. Thank you, Sahan, and um, hello to you and Paul, and a pleasure to be on your podcast once again. Thank you. So can you take us back to the fall of 1988 and the state of the Republic of Ireland national team following the surprisingly successful Euros? Well, following the Euros, you know, optimism was at an all-time high that the Republic were going to qualify for the 1990 World Cup. Uh, We had been drawn in a reasonably favourable group in that we had been drawn with uh, Spain, who obviously were the top seeds, but we were also drawn with Hungary, Northern Ireland and Malta, and with two teams to qualify, uh, the chances of us uh, getting to Italy seemed quite promising because although Spain were the favourites to uh, win the group, Hungary and Northern Ireland were both uh, regressing at that stage, I think it's fair to say. Uh, the Republic, on the other hand, were steadily improving. So on the outside, it looked like Spain would qualify and it would be a three-way fight between ourselves, Hungary and Northern Ireland for the second qualifying place, with with us being maybe slight favourites at that particular time. As you say, this was um, a, a bit of a new position for the Republic of Ireland to be seen I mean, effectively as as favourite to qualify, probably out of the, the three nations that you've you've mentioned. Would you say the expectation had been raised by the Euros with the public expecting qualification maybe this time? The public was certainly, uh, they were very optimistic and certainly very hopeful of qualification. More hopeful, I would say, than, you know, in, in any previous campaign because, I mean, the psychological barrier uh, which had existed up to Euro 88 had been broken in that Ireland had finally smashed the, the glass ceiling, so to speak, and actually qualified for a major tournament. So, you know, kind of any uh, psychological baggage that would have been left there up to that point you know, was gone by that stage. So, yeah, and of course the experience of Euro 88 and playing tournament football against high-quality opposition, naturally enough, was going to be a plus as well. And, yeah, so all in all, anyway, uh, the signs for the Republic qualifying were quite optimistic indeed. So the Republic of Ireland started its World Cup qualifying campaign against Northern Ireland at Belfast on September 14th, 1988. For this match, Jack Charlton selected the following squad. Packy Bonner was out injured, I believe, and he was replaced in the lineup by Jerry Payton of Bournemouth. The rest of the squad was Chris Morris of Celtic Glasgow, Mick McCarthy of Celtic Glasgow, Kevin Moran, captain of the side from Spanish club Sporting Gijón, Chris Houghton of Tottenham, Ray Houghton of Liverpool, Paul McGrath, Manchester United, Ronnie Willen of Liverpool, Kevin Shitty of Everton, John Aldridge of Liverpool, and Tony Cascarino of Millwall. As one would expect, this ended as a scoreless tie, a tough battle, satisfactory away point for the Republic, I, I would say. Yes, Shahan, I would uh, mostly go along with that because, uh, first of all, the game itself, you know, it was always going to be, in many ways, a typical English league game, you know, because, I mean, both, both sets of players would have been well accustomed to uh, playing uh, in the domestic leagues, both in England and Scotland. But um, just to go through the lineup there for a couple of moments, there was um, a couple of noteworthy features in it. Uh, first of all, Kevin Warren, as you said, captain the team. And along with Chris Houghton, both Kevin and Chris won, won their 40 caps uh, on this occasion. Uh, Ronnie Whelan actually won his top tier cap. 
Uh, he he was actually booked during the match. He picked up the yellow card. And strangely enough, when you look at it in this day and age, there were there was no substitutions made by the Republic. In other words, the starting eleven were the eleven that finished the game. So I mean, it's it's very rare nowadays, if at all, that in international soccer, you, you know, you have a situation like that where no substitutions are made throughout a game. Now, you mentioned Jerry Payton, and this was Jerry Payton's twenty fifth cap for the Republic, and. Even though we didn't know it at the time, this was to be his last competitive uh, cap. He won eight more caps uh, for the Republic, but uh, in the next four years up to 1992, but they would have been all in friendly games. So, as I say, his last competitive appearance was this game. He was playing because Packy Bonner was injured. And in many ways, you know, he was really an unsung hero of the Jack Charlton era in that he seemed to be, for much of it, if not all of his international career, he seemed to be a backup goalkeeper. And then the fact that he was playing with Bournemouth, who were, I suppose, floating between the second, the English second and third divisions at that time, you know, it meant that he did not have a particularly high profile. But he was a very reliable keeper, so always made himself available for the Republic. And when he was called on, he, he never let the side down. So in many ways, I would say uh, he, and perhaps maybe Dave Lynan as well, who of Oxford, who, of course, was finished playing by this stage for the Republic. They, they were two of the unsung heroes of that particular era. Now, the game itself, overall, it was a sloppy enough game. And uh, very early in the match, uh, Tony Cascarino had a seemingly legitimate goal, which wasn't given. Um, I remember it well. Ireland got a free kick after about two minutes. The ball was floated into the penalty area. Tony got his head onto it and the ball hit uh, one of the uprights and seemed to cross the goal line before it was retrieved by um, Alan McKnight, who was the Northern Ireland goalkeeper. But even though from the, from the television camera angles, it looked as though it was a goal. Uh, the goal was not given. So, Paul McGran, Ray Houghton apparently had unusually quite games uh, by their standards. And just before halftime, actually, the aforementioned Jerry Payton made a great save from uh, Northern Ireland's Colin Clark. He turned a Colin Clark uh, effort uh, around the post and quite a good save at that. But apart from that, as I said, it was a sloppy enough game. Little chances in it. And I suppose at the end of the day, a draw was a fair enough result. And maybe it's a scenario that Jack Charlton would have been happy with going into the game because, you know, going to Belfast... Um, even today, and certainly back in those days, you know, it was never an easy task. So, and the fact then that, you know, the, the North, they would have played a very similar type game to the Republic uh, would have meant that, you know, it really would have been a wall of attrition, I suppose, in many ways. And then the fact that it was being played in Belfast, you know, a small pitch in a small stadium, I suppose a lot of the play would have been tight and so on. But overall, I mean, the balance of play, uh, a draw w w was a fair enough result and a solid enough start uh, to the Republic's qualification campaign. Next, we have a friendly on October 19th, 1988 at Dublin against Tunisia. Now, this match served as a testimonial for Pedar O'Driscoll, the retiring FAI secretary. So for this match, we have the following lineup. Jer Payton's again back in the goal. We have Chris Morris. He'd be replaced by international debutant Patrick Scully of Arsenal mm -hmm. in the 46th minute. And this would mm -hmm. be his one and only cap for the Republic. Yes, uh, and, a, and a controversial selection as well, as we will see in a couple of moments. Yes. And uh, then we have captaining the team Mick McCarthy. We have John Anderson of Newcastle, international debutant Steve Staunton of Liverpool, Ray Houghton. He'd be replaced by David Kelly of West Ham in the 46th minute, Liam O'Brien of Manchester United, Kevin Sheedy, Mark Kelly of Portsmouth, Tony Cascarino of Millwall. He'd be replaced by Ken DeMang of uh, Hall City in the 70th minute. And this was 
can demand second and final cap. His first cap was in 1987, I believe, against Brazil, if I'm not mistaken. Right, yeah. Yeah. Correct. Mm. Yeah, he was he he was a U team player with Liverpool at the time. Right. Mm. Then we have uh, John Aldridge, and he'd be replaced by Niall Queen of Arsenal in the 70th minute. And we have to mention that this was John Anderson's 16th and final cap for the Republic. His first yeah. cap had been in 1979. So yes. Ireland won this match 4-0. Tony Cascarino scored in the 26th and 43rd minute. Most importantly, John Aldridge scored, scored his first goal for the Republic in the 45th minute. And Kevin Sheedy scored in the 87th minute. Was this goal a vindication for Aldridge, so underused at international level? Yeah, in many respects, Shahan, it was. Now, um, actually, this was also John Aldridge's 20th international cap, and it was Ray Houghton's 20th international cap as well. So, I mean, you know, a nice way to mark your uh, 20th international cap with your first international goal. But in many ways, you know, the Tunisia fixture uh, was an ideal opportunity for John Aldridge to break his international score in Duke. Um, because it had become a cause of concern. And even John Aldridge himself at the time was puzzled by the fact that prior up to this game, he had yet to break his international duck. But break the duck he did. And he had a considerable monkey off his back, I suppose, in that he had netted his first international goal. And the goals came at a reasonably regular basis after that. Now, the game itself, it was played, as you say, in Lansdowne Road. There was only 12,000 present. So that would indicate that, you know, Tunisia in those days weren't a particularly big draw. I suppose there was still, I won't say among the minnows of international soccer, but they certainly, you know, they certainly wouldn't have been a big name and certainly not at that particular time. Now, Liam O'Brien was a late call-up for Ronnie Whelan, who had, who had um, influenza. And David Kelly that you mentioned, this was actually his last appearance at the Federal Republic until uh, April 1990 against the USSR in a friendly. So uh, David, you know, was, wasn't to see international action again for another year and a half. And this was also the second last game for Mark Kelly. And actually Mark's last appearance came two years later in 1990 against Morocco. So... Even though we didn't know at the time, you know, that would told us that, you know, Matt Kelly was never to um he was never to make a competitive appearance uh, for the Republic. And uh, David Kelly, as I said, you know, it was, it was his last game until April 1990. Now, of course, the big talking point that I mentioned was the uh, selection of Pat Scully uh, ahead of David O'Leary, because Kevin Morn was injured for this game. And the expectation was, and it was even an expectation among uh, a lot of the Irish soccer press, was that David O'Leary was going to be called up and to finally end his international exile. Now, controversially, Pat Scully was selected. And Pat Scully was, he, he, he was a U-team player at Arsenal at this time. Uh, 19 years of age, but as it turned out, he never made the breakthrough in the English game. Now, Jack Charlton may have seen Pat Scully as a better long-term prospect, and maybe Jack wanted to give him, you know, a taste of international action in this game. Or else it was maybe Jack maybe had, you know, an inkling at this stage that there was a clamour out there to recall David O'Leary, and maybe Jack did not, or Jack did not want to bow to maybe what he would have perceived as, you know, noise from the media or pressure from the media to influence uh, his team selection. But whatever the reasons anyway were, uh, Pat Scully was selected. David O'Leary wasn't, and in the aftermath, uh, Pat Scully only played half the game. Uh, we we should point out. And in the aftermath of this game, a number of journalists who were particularly supportive of Jack in Ireland, they were even, you know, stepped into 
uh, openly ponder uh, in their newspaper columns as to why David O'Leary was still excluded. So, uh, as it turned out, the following month for the World Cup qualifier against Spain, uh, David was recalled. But I think myself from the reason to, of the situation, Jack was going to recall David O'Leary at some stage, I feel. But maybe Jack felt that if he recalled David O'Leary for this particular game against Tunisia, the media would maybe interpret it as, you know, Jack Wilton to uh, media pressure. And maybe Jack did not want that because, as you know, Jack was very taciturn and, you know, he was very much his own man, as we all know, when it came to team selections and team tactics and so on. So maybe it was Jack's way of saying that, you know, I will recall David O'Leary, but I will do so uh, at a time of my own choosing. That that would be my take on it anyway. And uh, another feature of this game, of course, is the uh, debut of... Steve Staunton, um, yeah. start of a long international career. Uh, what what can you say about his introduction to the team? Yeah, well, um, as I say, he, he he had made the breakthrough at Liverpool at this stage, and I suppose Jack saw this game as an opportunity to give Steve Staunton some valuable, you know, international game time, and uh, you, you know, Steve Staunton was to prove quite a useful addition both to the Ireland squads and to uh, the Liverpool. Uh, squad that you know he was to feature in for the next number of years, and subsequently, of course, you know he went to Aston Villa and then back to Liverpool again. So, you know, um, yeah, he was he was one as it turned out he was one of the Republic's great servants. Now, this game uh, we were only we were only restricted to television highlights of it because, as I say, it was a friendly game. There was only twelve thousand present, and um, haven't been able to locate any highlights on YouTube. So. I think the the, <laughs> the 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 memories of this particular game are just memories at this stage. But um, from what I recall of it anyway, yeah, it seemed to be kind of very much an uneventful game. It was, for most of the game anyway, it was all one-way traffic. Uh, the Republic completely dominating. Uh, Jack, in the second half, then Jack took the opportunity to introduce a few substitutions and make some changes. But I suppose, all taught anyway, it, it, it was just in many ways, a useful walkout uh, for, you know, several of the team. Because, ju just a footnote about this, when when the fixtures for the World Cup qualifying were being uh, compiled, the FAI's original uh, intention was to have Spain play the World Cup qualifier in October of 1988. But Spain actually decided against this. So because of that, there was a vacancy in the international calendar and this friendly against Tunisia was arranged. And, and of course, the other big takeaway, as we mentioned from this game, was John Aldridge, you, you know, finally getting on the score sheet at international level. Now, you already mentioned David O'Leary. Can you remind everyone of the reason for his absence for more than two years? Yes, in May at the end of May 1986, uh, at the end of the shall we say the, the the soccer season, just just before the 1986 World Cup, uh, the Republic of Ireland were invited to Iceland to take part in a triangular international tournament uh, between the Republic, Iceland, and Czechoslovakia. Now, uh, Jack Charlton was only three games, I think, was in, in into the role at this stage, and he was still, you know assessing his options and, you know, I suppose, casting the net wide, you know, and giving players their own. Now, the squad that Jack named for this tournament, there was a few defections from it, uh, namely uh, the Liverpool contingent of players at that particular time, uh, they uh, withdrew from it, uh, citing the effects of a long, hard season, because Liverpool, as you know, had done the domestic double in England. And uh, because of that, uh, Jack actually called uh, David O'Leary. Uh, did David had not featured for Jack at this stage yet. So uh, Jack contacted David O'Leary to see would David uh, be available, you, you know, for the trip to Iceland. And David um, David was something of a late call-up. Uh, as I say, he wasn't named in the original squad. He was only uh, contacted when the Liverpool contingent withdrew. Uh, David had already arranged a family holiday by this stage. So uh, David... I suppose, politely told Jack that, you know, he already had holiday plans made. And whether Jack saw this as a challenge to his authority 
or maybe a player snubbing him is unclear. But uh, because of that, uh, David O'Leary was uh, put in international exile for the next two and a half years. Where the inconsistency came in to this was, and I mentioned this in an earlier podcast, was that uh, the Liverpool contingent of players, Jim Bakelin, Ronnie Whelan and Mark Lawson, they had all withdrawn from this trip to Iceland. And yet, the following September, when Euro 88 qualifying began, uh, they were all, you know, recalled to the international squad, whereas uh, David O'Leary was left in international exile. And I suppose you could, you know, some people say that Jack Charlton kind of took the easy way out and he made an easy scapegoat of David O'Leary in that. At that time, the Republic had plenty of centre-halves to choose from. So it was one department that we were not shot in. And I suppose maybe Jack, wanted, Jack you know, saw the opportunity to stamp his authority and, you know, lay down a marker as to who was in charge of the team by excluding David. But as it turned out anyway, and as time was to go on, you know, the exclusion was becoming quite petty. And this was no more illustrated than in this game that we mentioned uh, in October 1988 against Tunisia. So I think because of the, I won't say the clamour, but because of the noise in the media and among some Irish soccer supporters as well, that, you know, perhaps it was time that, you know, Jack buried the hatchet with David O'Leary and recalled him into the international squad. David was subsequently recalled for the next game in November against Spain. Yes. So for this World Cup qualifier against group favorite Spain on November 16th at Sevilla, Ireland had a number of players out through injury. This included Chris Hutton, Paul McGrath, Ronnie Whelan, Kevin Sheedy, and Frank Stapleton. So for this match, Packy Bonner was back in the squad, goalkeeper of Celtic Glasgow. Then we have Morris McCarthy, the returning David O'Leary of Arsenal, Staunton, Houghton, captain of the team Moran, John Sheridan of Leeds, he'd be replaced by Liam O'Brien in the 81st minute, Tony Galvin of Sheffield Wednesday, Tony Cascarino, John Aldridge, and he'd be replaced by Niall Quinn in the 64th minute. So Spain would win this match 2-0. Manolo scored in the 53rd minute. And Butragueno scored a second goal in the 65th minute. So it was a disappointing loss. But we have to remember Ireland had many injuries. Yes, indeed. And um, that's a very good point you make, Shahan, in that after this game, Jack said that Spain did not beat Ireland 2-0. They beat a team that he had patched together 2-0. So, and it was one of those nights that Ireland were lucky to get nil, as as the saying goes. Because, I mean, they were ravaged with injuries. They played reasonably well in the first half, you know, kind of. And at halftime, you know, it was still scoreless. But... I suppose, you, you know, it was always odd son that, you know, Spain were gradually going to get the upper hand and they suddenly got the upper hand in the second half anyway with two goals. And of course, you know, roared on then by a raucous home crowd in Seville. It was always going to be, I suppose, maybe in many ways a trip into the lines then for the Republic. But this anyway, as, as you mentioned, was the return of David O'Leary. This was his 41st cap and he was paired with Rick McCarthy in the centre of defence. And whether it was the fact that it was O'Leary's first game for Ireland in two and a half years or not, I don't know. But um, some of the Irish media were kind of unsure about this centre-half pairing going forward, uh, namely the centre-half partnership of Mick McCarthy and David O'Leary. And actually, uh, the best Irish player on the night was Tony Galvin. And this was his first game for Ireland since the Euros. And as it turned out, this was to be his penultimate game uh, for Ireland as well. Uh, Kevin Moran played in midfield as Paul McGrath was absent. And the two goals that Ireland conceded in this game, Shahan, these, as it turned out, were the only goals that Ireland were to concede in the whole qualifying campaign. 
I mean, it was obvious by this stage that, you know, Jack's philosophy of, you know, keeping it tight at the back uh, was working in that our goals against ratio uh, had drastically reduced. And, you know, when you don't concede goals, you know, you're always in with a chance of uh, holding on for a draw in games or maybe nicking a goal at the other end and getting a win. But as I say, they were under strength against Spain. A good Spanish team as well, it has to be said. Spain, of course, had disappointed at Euro 88, albeit uh, they, they had been in a tough group. But they were the top seeds in this qualification campaign. So they were always going to be favourites uh, to finish first in the group and qualify in first place. So I suppose really, in an overall sense, it was really a case of damage limitation for the Republic. Uh, considering that they were shot so many players. And actually, Liam O'Brien that you mentioned, this was to be his last competitive appearance for the Republic. Uh, he won one more cap, and that was in 1992 against Switzerland in in a friendly. So, yeah, I mean, a disappointing result put Ireland on the back foot as regards qualification. That did only one point now from two games, albeit two difficult away games at that. And it wasn't going to get any easier for the Republic in the short term, in that their next qualifier in March was also going to be away to Hungary in Budapest. As you say, this was a, a much-changed team. Do you, do you feel that maybe the full-strength Irish side could have held on for a, a goalless draw, yeah. maybe, with that strong defensive record? Yeah, that is a possibility as well, Paul. Although, I suppose, at this stage, it's it's... I suppose it's wishful thinking to guess that. But, yeah, you could make that argument quite easily that maybe had Ireland been at full strength, they may well have maybe got a goalless draw or maybe even sneaked a goal and maybe, you know, it might have been a scoring draw because, as I say, you, you know, Spain were roared on by a raucous home crowd in Seville. They were always difficult to beat in Seville. So even with a full strength Irish team, it was going to be a tough task to go to uh, Seville and get a result. But... I suppose as it turned out, as I say, with, with Ireland travel by injuries, you know, getting a result, there was never a realistic option. So I suppose in many ways, it was just a case of damage limitation. And I mean, they they done well, it must be said, all things told, you know, in keeping the final score down to 2-0. So we come to the new year, 1989. The first match of the year is a friendly at Dublin at Delimount Park against France in the mud. So for this match, we have Bonner, Morris, McCarthy, captain this time, McGrath, Houghton, Houghton, Willen, international debutant Andrew Townsend of Norwich, Liam Brady returning from West Ham, Frank Stapleton, at this point he was at Le Havre in France, and he'd be replaced by John Aldridge in the 75th minute and Tony Cascarino. So this match is perhaps not really remembered in the annals of Irish football history, but it did mark the debut of Andy Townsend. Can you talk about his selection at this point? Yes, indeed. Well, this, this, as you say, was Andy's debut. Uh, he qualified for the Republic uh, through his paternal grandmother, who was a native of County Kerry. And uh, he had been on Jack Charlton straight after some time. And when it became evident that Andy was eligible for the Republic, uh, through the, the granny rule, if you want to call it that, uh, Jack Charlton saw the opportunity. And it was to be a very shrewd you know, decision by Jack, because... Andy Townsend turned out to be quite a notable player for the Republic in 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 the years to come, and I suppose looking back on it now, it's fair to say that he I suppose he was one of the Republic's all time great servants. You know he he had a long and distinguished international career, played at two World Cup finals, captained uh, the team in the ninety four World Cup in the USA, and his international career continued up to the fall of nineteen ninety seven. So. Yeah, it was it was certainly a very shrewd and, as it turned out, a prudent selection by Jack uh, to to get Andy Townsend into the international fold. This game, as you mentioned, it was played at Daly Mount Park. Funnily enough, for an international friendly at home, the game was televised live. 
here in Ireland. And maybe that was down to the fact that Daly Mount Park had a smaller capacity uh, than Lansdowne Road. And maybe maybe French television had something to do with the game being played in Daly Mount Park as well, in that maybe, you know, maybe a, ne- a nighttime kickoff suited French television as well. I'm not too sure. Because, you know, France, even though they were sort of in transition at the time, you would imagine that a game against opposition like France would have been played in a larger stadium. But for some reason, anyway, it was played in uh, Daly Mount Park. Now, for France as well, actually, this was Laurent Blanc's debut. Just an interesting side note to this game. Now, overall, it was um, it was Frank Stapleton's first appearance uh, since the Euros and Liam Brady's uh, first game since, you know, his sending off in 1987 against Bulgaria. And, and Ronnie Whelan's first game since the previous September against Northern Ireland. Now, it was a poor game, and as the game progressed, uh, the pitch deteriorated uh, considerably. So I actually remember uh, watching this game on TV, and I have to say that the memories of it are virtually nil at this stage, because it was a very poor game. There was really nothing, nothing of note in the game, and... I suppose the takeaway from it, apart from Andy Townsend's debut, I suppose there wasn't really an awful lot of other takeaways from it, except that, you know, it was a valuable run out uh, for uh, the Irish team and for some of the players, you know, ahead of some crucial upcoming qualifying games against both Hungary and Spain. So the next qualifier was on the following month, on March 8th, now, Hungary hosted the Republic of Ireland at Budapest. For this match, we have Bonner, Morris, Hewton, McCarthy, Morn, captain of the team, McGrath, Whelan, Houghton, Aldridge. He'd be replaced by Liam Brady in the 79th minute, Cascarino. He'd be replaced by Niall Quinn in the 79th minute, and Kevin Sheedy. So just like the first qualifier against uh, Northern Ireland, Ireland uh, came away with a scoreless tie from this match as well, which I imagine an away point is always valuable. So that would have satisfied Jackie Charlton, I imagine. Yeah, uh, in an overall sense, it would. But Jack was also angry that we hadn't won this particular game. Um, Because even though, you know, we had played... At this stage, you know, we had played our three uh, toughest qualifiers at this stage. In other words, the, the 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 three games against the opposition in the group, Spain, Hungary, Northern Ireland, all away from home. You know, we were struggling because we, we only had two points gained and most significant of all, no goals scored. So it was obvious at this stage, even though it was another point away from home, it was obvious at this stage that you know, Ireland were going to have to win all their home games uh, in order to uh, qualify for the World Cup. Now, this was a very poor game. And strangely enough, Jack Charlton omitted Frank Stapleton and Tony Galvin from the match day 16. Because, as you know, in those days, you could only name a, a match day squad of 16, you know, the 11 uh, players plus five substitutes. Um, not like today where you can, you, you, you know, name a 22 uh, or 23 uh, match day squad. And John Aldridge and Tony Cascarino were only substituted with 10 minutes remaining. Now, Ireland had plenty of possession, but they wasted a lot of set pieces. They were cut offside a lot because Hungary uh, made diligent use of, the, of, of, the, of, of playing the offside trap. And the only real chance Ireland had was when a marvellous overhead effort by McGrath was tipped over the bar. From a Hungarian point of view, their best player was a player I'm sure you are familiar with, Lajos Dettery. I hope I got the pronunciation right there. And had he adopted a more, shall we say, aggressive approach, rather than making long passes to his colleagues, Ireland could really have been in trouble because... Um, he was really the standout player in this game, a standout player from both sides. And maybe if he'd taken the game a bit more by the scruff of the neck, 
you know, Hungary may well have sneaked a victory and Ireland, Ireland, of course, would really have been in trouble. So, as I say, it was a very poor game. As I say, with two points from three matches at this stage, Spain were running away with the group and they had five games played at this stage and they were on maximum points, 10 points, as as you know, in those days, it was two points for a win. So, it was obvious that we were, you know, going to have to win all our home qualifiers because when the, when the World Cup fixtures were arranged, uh, Jack was keen to get uh, what he saw as the difficult qualifiers out of the way first. And Jack had targeted a return of three points from these first three uh, qualifying games. But we only ended up taking two. So, as I say from that, it, 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 it was putting us under pressure, you know, in the group, even at this early stage. And although we had four home qualifiers to come and a remaining away qualifier against Malta, you know, it was obvious at this stage that we were going to have to pick up points and pick them up uh, fairly quickly if we were to qualify for Italia 90. As you say, the, the positive was that the, the defence was very solid at, at this yes. time. But, um, yeah, we, we did this then increase the pressure, particularly ahead of the, the Spain game? It did, it, yeah, it, it did, yes, absolutely. Because, I mean, as I say, Jack had targeted three points from the first three matches because, as he said, if we had got three points, you know, it would have given us maybe a bit of space in that, you know, we could maybe afford to drop a point at home, maybe against Spain, because Spain were always Spain were always going to be the most difficult opposition in the group. And even in Lansdowne Road, they were going to be very tough opposition indeed. So... Yeah, so it, it put us under pressure, as I said, in the group. And it really made this Spain game to follow in month a must-win encounter. This match against Spain was on April 26, 1989 at uh, Dublin at Lansdowne Road. So for this match, we have Bonner, Hewton, Staunton, McCarthy, captaining the team, Morn, McGrath, Houghton, Cascarino, Stapleton, he replaced by Townsend in the 67th minute, Whelan, and Kevin Sheedy. So Spain won this match 1 0. So in the 16th minute, Ray Houghton crossed from the right from the right side, intended for Frank Stapleton. But the Spanish star Michel he diverted the cross into his own net, and Ireland won. And kept a clean sheet. Yes, absolutely. Well, well. First of all, this really was, you know, kind of a, a real marquee occasion. Uh, I, I remember it well because you know it was one of those games where you know the build up to the game, you, you know, took on a life of its own. It was a sellout Lansdowne Road, fifty thousand people uh, packed in, uh, a partisan support, and really nothing less than an Irish victory uh, was going to suffice. Now, we, we should mention as well that the, the Liverpool contingent of players, Ronnie Weed and Ray Houghton and Steve Starton, this was actually their first game at any level since the Hillsborough disaster. So, in many ways, you know, tremendous credit is due to those players, you know, for making themselves available for this game. Uh, John Aldridge actually was uh, still, you know, I suppose John Aldridge, I suppose, would have been more emotionally connected to the aftermath of Hillsborough. So uh, John Aldridge actually uh, withdrew from this game because he, he reckoned he was in no you, you know proper condition to play because obviously the, the, the devastation of Hillsborough hit him the hardest. But the the other Liverpool play, players, as I said, you know, did play and, and they all played quite well, you, you know, which which was testament to them considering the fact that, you know, a lot of them would not have kicked the ball, you know, for a week and a half and then having to deal, you know, with the with, with the trauma of Hillsborough, which was still ongoing at this particular time, it must be said. So, yeah, so uh, just uh, mention about the team. This was Peggy Bonner's 30th cap. Uh, it was Kevin Sheedy's 20th appearance. And it was a battle in Irish performance and they fully deserved their victory. Uh, Tony Cascarino was outstanding. This was really one of Tony's best performances ever for the Republic. He was outstanding both in the air and in link-up play. And in many ways, it was reminiscent of Ireland's victory over France back 
in the World Cup qualifiers in 1981, in that, you know, you had a partisan crowd. There was an expectant atmosphere and nothing less than a win would suffice. OK, the goal we got was an own goal. You know, it was something of a, a, a scrappy effort, um, but it was a win nonetheless. And as it turned out, you know, we, we dominated the game. Could have maybe got a second goal, but, you know, a very satisfying performance. And it really catapulted us right back into, you know, the qualification mix. Now, unfortunately, there was there was, there was sort of one downside to this. And this, it really wasn't evident or it wasn't really made evident in the, in the euphoria of the Irish victory. But the state of the Lansdowne Road pitch uh, was really a cause of concern because Luis Suarez, the Spanish manager, he actually, you know, was quite critical of the condition of the pitch in that the grass was quite long and it stifled teams that would have been playing, you know, particularly a short passing game. And as I mentioned in a previous podcast, the state of the Lancer Road pitch was to become a, a hot potato uh, in, the, in the succeeding years. And it was to continue that way up to about 1993 or so, when, as we'll see in a later podcast, a series of events took place that fi- that finally meant that, you know, the Lansdowne Road pitch was going to be in good condition. But, yeah, Louis Suarez anyway complained of the long grass on the pitch. And is it, it turned out anyway afterwards that actually Jack had requested, Jack Charlton had requested the Lansdowne Road groundsman to keep the, the grass long in that he reckoned it would stifle Spain's passing game. And it would really have been suited to the Republic's game, particularly, you know, when it came to um, playing in the air. Because, you see, when, when you have when you have a poor pitch surface, you know, chances are a lot of the game is going to be played in the air and that was going to suit the Republic. Yeah, so as I say, uh, be that as it may anyway, uh, qualification was back on track and it set us up nicely for um, two uh, home qualifiers uh, at the end of the season against both Hungary and Malta. Yes, this win against Spain was really a catalyst because at this point, there must have been a genuine feeling that Ireland were set to qualify at least as a runner-up since at this point, Spain was running away with the group. Yes, yes. And it was going to be a three-way battle between ourselves, Hungary and Northern Ireland for the second spot. And the fact that, as I say, Hungary and Northern Ireland were both kind of declining a little bit at this stage meant that we were favourites. Now, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't helped either by the fact that, you know, John Aldridge, for reasons already stated, uh, did not play in this match. So that made the Irish victory all the more notable. And it meant as well that we were back in the mix and of qualification. And with games in hand on both Hungary and Northern Ireland, there was a reasonably good chance of us actually qualifying. I think after this performance against Spain, uh, it was acknowledged at this stage that the key game was going to be in June against Hungary, which we, which will come to shortly. But yeah, so all told anyway, after the Spanish game, Ireland were in a very promising position indeed. So the next qualifier was on May 28th, again at Dublin at Lansdowne Road against Malta. For this match, we have Bonner, Houghton, O'Leary, Morin, captain of the team, Staunton, Houghton. He replaced by Townsend in the 69th minute. McGrath, Whelan, Sheedy, Stapleton. He replaced by John Aldridge in the 27th minute and Tony Cascarino. So Ireland won this match 2 0. Houghton scored with a long range shot in the 32nd minute. And Moran doubled the lead when he headed in Shidi's corner kick from the right side. So minimum done, basically. Just get a win, get out. Yes, 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 indeed, absolutely. Now, first of all, a couple of point, a couple of points about this game, Shahan. David O'Leary and John Aldridge. Uh, this was a notable game for them in that this game was played less than forty-eight hours after. You know, the famous oh, 1989 yes, yes. title in England between Liverpool and Arsenal. And, of course, in the aftermath of that game, 
of the Arsenal Liverpool game that is uh, David O'Leary went to console John Aldridge and I think John Aldridge uh, rebuffed him quite rudely so it was remarkable you know in some respects that you know less than 48 hours later both of these players were say, were playing in the same team <laughs> you know uh, albeit of course you know at a different level and a different competition and in actual fact uh, the Arsenal title party celebrations were taking place in North London on this particular Sunday. So it meant that David O'Leary had to miss the, the Arsenal title celebrations because he was playing for Ireland in this game. Now, Mick McCarthy was absent, as you mentioned, so Kevin Moore captained and marked the occasion, of course, by scoring a goal. Ray Houghton, who, of course, got the other goal, this was his 25th cap. It was Paul McGrath's top tier cap. The Maltese display, for the for the most part, was negative and cynical. Uh, they they were coached at this stage, as you know, by a German host, Hazy. And really, Malta were really, they were really, with no disrespect to them, the make weights in this group. I suppose this game in particular, it showed Ireland's inability to, you know, score big against weak opponents. Um, in fact, in fact, I mean the the fact that we only won the game two 0 uh, a game that we almost completely dominated from start to finish. You know, only scoring two goals was a concern in that. Now, uh, Charlton, Jack Charlton wasn't happy in the aftermath of this game because Ronnie Whelan was booked, and this was Ronnie Whelan's second yellow card in the qualification. So it meant that he was to miss the game against Hungary. And Frank Stapleton was also to miss the game against Hungary because in this game, uh, Frank twisted his knee. And so uh, he was to be out of the Hungary game as well. So, I mean, it was obvious at this stage, after the win against Malta, that, you know, the Hungary game was going to be, you, you know, the, the key game in this group. It was really going to be a make or break game as regards uh, the qualification chances for Ireland. And maybe perhaps Hungary as well. And the fact that we were going to be without Ronnie Whelan and Frank Stapleton, you know, was going to make things a little bit more difficult. So overall, anyway, it was job done. I suppose the main thing, apart from Frank Stapleton's injury and Ronnie Whelan's booking, nobody picked up injuries. So that meant that most of the players were going to be available, you know, for the following Sunday's game against Hungary. Yes, so this match against Hungary, the final match of the season and the final qualifier of the season, was on June 4th at Dublin at Lansdowne Road. So we have the following lineup. Bonner, Houghton, Staunton, O'Leary, Morn, captain of the team, Townsend, McGrath, he replaced by Morris in the 79th minute, Houghton, Aldridge, He'd be replaced by Liam Brady in the 74th minute, Cascarino, and Sheedy. Ireland would win this important match 2-0. Paul McGrath scored in the 34th minute. And near the end, in the 82nd minute, Tony Cascarino scored the headed in the deciding goal. And Ireland won this important match. And I believe after this match, it was more or less confirmed that Ireland were most likely going to qualify. Yes. Yes, indeed. Well, this match was notable for a number of reasons, Shan. First of all, it was the 250th Republic of Ireland International. It was Liam Brady's 70th cap. Uh, He came on, as you said, as a substitute. And it was also the Republic's first ever win over the Hungarians at international level. So, yeah, it it was a really good performance. You know, a nice blend of forceful and forthright soccer with plenty of skill thrown into the mix as well. This was Andy Townsend's first competitive start and he gave a man of the match display. Um, David O'Leary gave a commanding performance at the back and I suppose re- really, you know, vindicated his return from international exile. Liam Brady, as I said, came on as a substitute. But I think we were to see at this stage, this was to be sort of a gradual phasing out of Liam Brady. 
even though it wasn't evident at the time, you know, uh, with the passage of time, we can we can see that this was really the start of his, you know, gradual, I suppose, facing out uh, of, the, of the Irish team. Um, in that he was really, I suppose, from now on, only going to be seen, you know, as an impact substitute. But, yeah, I mean, it was it was a very welcome win. Uh, you, you know, there was um, a fantastic atmosphere in Lansdowne Road. You you know, it was it was um a good soccer, nice weather, and it was actually a holiday weekend here in Ireland as well. Um so you know that contributed very much to, you know, a feel good uh, or uh, you know, a euphoric feeling. And after this game, we were really in an outstanding position to uh, qualify for Italia ninety against admittedly a Hungarian team that, you know, were regressing and you know, really needed to result themselves out of this game to keep them in the mix. They did give the Republic uh, a couple of, you, you know, anxious moments in the second half. But as I say, when to- when Tony Cascarino got his sec- the second goal 10 minutes from the finish, that really uh, put the seal on um, a marvellous Irish performance and put us in pole position uh, for qualification. As you say, this seems like a real high point for Irish football. Really, yes. really strong at home, more or less on the verge of qualification for a, a second major tournament in a row. Was was this positive feeling, you know, shared, you know, really by the press, which had been critical in the past as well as the public? Would you say? Yeah, f- f- very much so, Shahan. In that, or, or Paul, I should say, sorry, in that. Um, this was really, I should have mentioned this as well, this was the first qualification campaign and it was a sign of, of kind of the feel-good factor uh, in Irish soccer at the time that all the qualifying games of the Republic were televised live in Ireland, both the away games and the home games. And the reason the home games were televised live was that by this stage, for an Irish international soccer game, Lansdowne Road was a guaranteed sellout. In other words, they were guaranteed a 50,000 capacity attendance there. So with matches being guaranteed sellouts at this stage, uh, it meant that games could home games could be televised live. And there was a real feel-good factor uh, about the team, you know, and, uh, and about all things uh, Republic of Ireland at this stage. And what was noticeable as well was that at this stage, and I, I know Shahan mentioned this a few podcasts back, uh, Donny Butler, uh, he had been appointed commercial manager of the FAI in 1986. And by this stage, him and his colleagues uh, in the FAI commercial division, they had implemented a policy of, in the days leading up to the game, the match programmes for the home matches would be available in news agents throughout Ireland. Because I recall, actually, I was in Limerick City at, uh, two days uh, before this Hungary game on the Friday, and on the shelves of uh, a well-known news agents in there was the programme for the Ireland-Hungary match. So it meant what, what it meant was that the FAI could make extra money from programme sales by making the programme available to those who, you know, weren't able to get to the game and who would be watching the game on television. So it was a shrewd marketing move by the FAI. As I say, you know, kind of they were really in the money at this stage in that... You know, I mean, they, they were guaranteed 50,000 crowds for home international games. And, you know, it gave the FAI um, a, a very strong financial footing, you know. And we were to see this a few years down the road when, you know, the issue of the condition of the Lansdowne Road pitch was uh, finally resolved uh, in 1993 when the FAI uh, put up most of the sum of installing floodlights in Lansdowne Road and in return, the IRFU, uh, the Irish Rugby Football Board, who owned Lansdowne Road, gave an undertaking that the condition of the Lansdowne Road pitch would be, you, you know, fastly improved. In other words, where possible, um, if rugby games were scheduled for Lansdowne Road on Saturdays prior to international soccer matches, uh, the rugby games would be either deferred or moved to um, different venues. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was significant as well. And if you look back, actually, at this Hungry game on YouTube and even, you know, look at the advertising hoardings around the ground, they were very indicative of the time because by this stage, almost every every business, 
or a very well-known business in Ireland, you know, was anxious to uh, get a part of it. So there was no problem selling uh, advertising space. And even at that time in 1989, uh, we were a couple of weeks shot out from a general election in Ireland. And even one particular prominent political party, they actually had uh, an advertising hoard in, in a prominent uh, dis, in a prominent place uh, in the ground. So <laughs> everybody was cashing in on it. And of course, it meant that the FAI, from a commercial point of view, they were no longer uh, the poor relations because, as you know, you know, only a few years previous, there was no guarantee that they could even, you know, get Lansdowne Water matches due to their financial situation. But now, I mean. You know, the fact that they were, you know, really getting sell-out crowds and, you know, kind of making money as well, you know, and selling all kinds of Republic of Ireland soccer merchandise and so on. It's meant that, you know, kind of things were definitely looking up at all levels. And the fact that, you know, Ireland looked set to qualify for the, for, for the following year's World Cup, that's really, you, you know, contributed to um, very much a feel-good factor. That really was evident you know, throughout Ireland, and particularly throughout that summer of 1989. But, shall we say, but, shall we say, in, in sport and life, and in, indeed, life in general. So, good times are long, too. Mm. So, in closing, what were the takeaways from this successful season, apart from the loss in Spain? Yeah. Well, the takeaway as well was that Kind of, we 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 had a solid international team at that stage. You know, we had blooded some players that were to make their mark in the coming years. Players like Andy Townsend and uh, Steve Staunton, just to mention two. We were not conceding goals, which was very important. And I suppose at this stage, you know, Jack was well on his way to uh, being able to walk on water, as uh, as the saying goes here in Ireland. Yeah, so all around anyway, you 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 know, the vibes were very good indeed. And it was to set us up, you know, for the momentous uh, season that was to come, uh, the 1989-90 season. And, yeah, so all told, anyway, you know, kind of, um, it was all good. Mm. At, at, actually, Paul, while you're there, ju just if I can put a question to you at this stage. I mentioned, of course, that, you know, kind of, there was greater television coverage of the Republic at this stage. And would, would this greater coverage have been reflected in the English press? Um, yeah, yeah, I think to some extent, um, following the the European Championship, there was there was probably more interest than previously, and as we know, you know the the bulk of the side were were playing in the playing for first division clubs as well, so the players were all very well known. Yeah, probably more press coverage, but I wouldn't say it necessarily translated into television coverage, which was still. Of course. Fairly restricted generally at, at, at this time. Um, mm -hmm. You would probably see the goals, maybe some brief highlights at this at this time, um, but that that would more or less be it. Um, yeah. But generally, I would say you know that they you know the the republic were were more closely followed now, following those Euros going into um, Italia ninety, definitely. Um, Obviously, so many people have a connection anyway uh, to Ireland, but they were they were definitely sort of a, probably the the second team for a lot of uh, yeah. English uh, fans got, at this and, time. Yeah, and like with the English press, you know, uh, shall we say, particularly the print media, Paul, uh, coverage that they would have given of Ireland of Irish games, would they generally have been complimentary of the team, or would they say have been you know critical of Jack Charlton's tactics? Yeah, I think I'd have to say with that with that reservation, the press were often quick to point out things like the the state of the pitch and leaving the grass longer against um, passing teams like Spain. Yeah, there, there was always a little bit of an edge, may, maybe a little bit of um, resentment following the the defeat in uh, in Germany as well. I think might have played a part in that. A little bit of um, snobbery maybe as as well but I, th I think most fans were you know were pleased that the republic yeah. were doing so well and yeah, appreciative because... of it but 
yeah, the press may be a slightly different story. You, you're right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because particularly in the build up to Italia ninety, um, I remember looking at say, you know, some of the some of the the Danish, uh, shall we say, the tabloids, and for the most part, lots of them, you know, were quite complimentary of the Republic, and you know, now whether they were being patronising or not, I'm not too sure, but uh, yeah, they were quite appreciative of you know the strides the Republic had made at international level, and um, you know, yeah, so I know I was just wondering because, as as you know, there was always a small minority here who would have been critical of Jack Charlton's tactics. So I was just wondering, you know, kind of would that same criticism have extended, you know, to, to, to the English media? Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. And I think, again, probably more in the in, in the broadsheets who had a, a more particular idea of how, how teams should play uh, rather than appreciating that, you know, uh, Jack was obviously maximising the resources he had there, and there was also the the other element of that was this the uh, you know we discussed the uh, the the granny rule as you described it yeah. that allowed oh. Townsend to play, and there was still a little bit of um, you know again maybe scepticism around that um, around yeah. Cascarino and uh, and even maybe Aldridge and Houghton to some extent all declaring for the for the Republic as well. Yes, yes. But then, of course, you see kind of, I suppose, maybe, okay, maybe the Republic were kind of maybe the, the trailblazers in that regard, but particularly today, I mean, you know, every international team is doing this. And, he, and even back then, it was pointed out in the Irish press that, you know, England even had card on players such as, you know, John Barnes and Terry Butcher who were born outside of England. Yeah, I, I'm well, absolutely well, right. I mean, I, I, I do think a lot of it was was a certain amount of uh, resentment and frustration. Obviously, England eventually ended up doing well in that World Cup, but at the time, you know, England was struggling a little bit, and maybe there was, uh, you know, maybe, maybe some of those they felt like they were easy targets to uh, have a go. But I don't think it was reflected um, among the fans as such. Yeah, of course, yes, yeah. With that. We can thank you for your participation in this series. As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. You may contact me on my blog and on Facebook under Soccer Nostalgia. On Twitter, I'm at SP1873. Mr. Paul Will can be contacted on his blog, The 1888 Letter, and on Twitter, he's at 1888 Letter. You may also follow the podcast on Spotify, Google, and Apple, all under Soccer Nostalgia Talk Podcast. Please leave a review, rate, and subscribe if you like the podcast. And all of Mr. Carroll's contact info is also listed on the blog and podcast uploads. So, John, thank you very much and hope to continue these discussions on Irish football history. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, always lovely to, uh, to, to know, discuss them. And particularly, you know, there were great times for the Republic. And of course, you know, nowhere more so than, I suppose, hopefully in our next podcast, when we will review, you, you know, the the seminal season of 1989, 1990, which culminated, of course, in Italian 90 itself. Yeah, looking forward to that one. Thank you. Yeah, all Thank the you. best.